So basically, yeah, I think it's good. Like since my topic is the price of living small, so we have a small group of people. That's more, you know, that's more comfortable for me. Yeah, I promise to myself it's like, even if like, they want or two people come, I'm okay with that. Yeah, as long as there's someone listen to me. <laughs> okay, so before I get started with my speech, I want uh, all of you guys to stand up and we're going to have a very small activity. I'm sorry <laughs> for <laughs> interfering with your donut. <laughs> Okay, this is a very small game. No, not really a game. A small practice. Now close your eyes. And when I count from five to one, you're going to start imagining one thing or one person or a word or a phrase, something that you want to achieve in the next three months. Okay? Now I'm going to start from five. Now you're seeing that thing. I see you open your eyes. <laughs> okay. You're seeing that thing. Now close your eyes. Still closing your eyes. Yes. Five, you're seeing that thing in your mind. It's right in front of you. Something, someone that you want to achieve in the next three months. M4, now you're moving a little bit closer to that thing. And three, now rise your right arm your right arm lift it up your right arm and then rise your left arm for two still close your eyes the pictures of it the image of it is in your vision something you see from your vision and one now you are holding it you are embracing it that thing okay thank you so much now open your eyes and have a seat I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, what's in your vision? Spain. Having a successful team together. Also, your vision is a lot like this, or that's amazing. Five seconds. I see, I see Poland. Poland, the country, yeah. We can yeah, yes. Uh, I see breakfast. <laughs> uh, a full night's sleep, which is why it was nice to close my eyes. <laughs> okay, the last question. My daughter. So actually this is a, it's actually meditation. And the thing that I usually do every morning is my, you know, daily routine. And spir spiritually, oh, Ajahn Fino is coming. <laughs> okay, so spir spiritually speaking, basically we as human beings, we are actually connected to the universe. And I'm not sure if you have ever heard about the laws of attraction. If you have ever heard about that, it means whenever you think of something, you start to send a message to the universe. And then the universe will get back to you that thing, some things that you want to achieve. So one small tip to get the things to achieve, the things that you want to have, is to practice it every morning. Spend only five seconds or 10 seconds to think of the things that you want. When you repeat the pattern, then the thing will come to you unexpectedly. Yeah. This is what I, I learned from an Indian master, not from me. He taught me that. Yeah, he spent like five or six years in India, and then like he just like moved around the world to teaching people. And it actually worked for me, so I want to share with you. You're going to see it uh, like you have four nights sleep. You're going to have it soon. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So this is a bit of information about me. Uh, yeah, it's not really important. I just want you to know that the last information, this is my dog. Yeah, I really want to promote him everywhere. So basically everyone knows about him. 
he's going to have his own social media channel soon. He's going to be a celebrity, I swear. Okay. Next thing, this is the question. Do you feel like you aren't belonging to any communities? Once in your life, have you ever questioned that? If the answer is yes, please raise your hand. If the answer is yes, raise your hand. Once in your life, you feel like you don't belong to any community, like to any, it means like to no community at all. Like you're alone, you're alone with, you don't belong to anything in this world. Oh, so there's only one person. He feel like he doesn't belong to any community. Actually, even the, yeah, even the answer is yes or no, actually, the truth, the fact that we actually at least belong to two or three or more communi communities simultaneously, like at one time, right? It's a fact, and we cannot, like, reject the fact. When you look at the Maslow hierarchy of needs, actually, the feeling of belonging, of being inclusive, it's community, and it's on a third level. It means it's very important for all of us. And we as human beings, we are actually belong to each other. And when we don't feel like we belong, it actually triggers uh, you know, the pain regions in your brain, and then it suddenly becomes the real physically physical pain. This is not from my work, it's a research from the States. And when you come through the feeling of that, you feel heartbroken, you feel depressed, you feel lonely. But actually, no, you're not alone. You always belong to somewhere. That's the answer. Let's say each of us is a small, it's a tiny status in the universe. And this universe so far, it counts it accounts for 91 billion light years, right? So at least each of us is a special individual in this universe. So we are still belong to one huge, enormous universe. So we are actually a community. So next time when you think you are lonely, or when you feel like you don't belong to anywhere else, no, you don't, you actually do. You actually belong. When we were little, our very first community is your family. It's your, fr it's your father, your mother, your relative, your grandparents, your sister and brothers. They are your very first community. And when you look at the definition of communi community in some online or some academic paper, they're going to define that community is when a group of people, they share the same area or they share some common senses, some common characteristic. And it's your family, they share the same houses with you. And to some people, they may say that, no, but I don't, re I don't really have a parents when I was born. I did not have a parents. My parents left me. I was a parent. I was come from, I, was, uh, I came from an orphanage, an orphan. I'm an orphanage, so yeah, even when it is, you still belong to your you know, orphan community. You still have your childhood friends. And to for the regular children, when you as went to the kindergarten, you start to make friends, and you start to have more friends. Some some five or six years old, they even have the first love. Seriously, <laughs> yeah, and that's the moment when your community gets bigger. It's not like shrink. It's not shrinking. It's getting bigger. So actually. The truth is that your community just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger from your family and to your friends. And when you grow up, you make your soulmate, your boyfriend or girlfriend, someone, and you get married. That's your spouse. And you two all together recreate another small community. It's your family. That's a circle. And besides of that, <laughs> sorry, and besides of that, your boss, your co-workers and your friends, the people who you work, like right here at BOI campus, your colleges, they are actually another communities of you. We are all working under one environment to achieve one goal. 
for example, a business, they want to increase sales, right? So that's the one goal, that's the one share common from the company. So basically, they are your community. So no matter where you go, even when you just cannot get out of the definition of community because you always belong. So the very first definition of community, it comes from the relationship, the direct relationship from you. This is my very first community. This is my family, and this is me. <laughs> okay. I have some friends. <laughs> After I shared this point of view with him, he said that, okay, so now what if I just like get myself out of all the community? I don't interact with people, I will just stay home. So what's the point of that? Uh, do I still belong to any communities? Or do I really get myself out of that? My answer is like, no, you still belong to the community. The food that you are eating, the water that you are drinking every day, the clothes that you are wearing, they are not grow up, they are not made by themselves. There is a farmer, there's a designer, there is someone out there created it for you. So you still belong to them. Whatever you put on your body or you, you know, absorbing, it still belongs to someone. So actually, they are your community. It's just not direct, it's, dir it's indirect, but still they are your community. So you still belong to someone else out there. You just don't know them very. Even when you stay home, you want someone to deliver food to your house, and then the person is the delivery man, right? Delivery man, so he's your community. That's why I say your environment makes your community. Why am I saying this? Because my friend, after I shared that point of view with him, he called to me by saying that, okay, now I just go to a very far away land. Yeah, he said that. <laughs> I can't believe that, but he said that. And I'm going to live up high in the mountain, like the monk, you know, live in a deep down forest or in the up high mountain. I'm not going to interact with any human beings. So now, Am I really out of the definition of community? I was like, no. Because community definition, the definition of it is not limited between human and human, but it's also about human and the nature. You see that? Basically, some as human beings, we think we are more advanced animal species, like we are better, we are smarter than the other animals, the other species. But when you live up, w when you put yourself in the forest, are you sure you're better than them? Maybe you can kill some rabbits, but there will be a big bear or lion eating you later on. Yeah, that's the definition. And that's how, that's the true nature of community. It's the natural community of the world. So, I told my friends, no, you can you can just not get out of that definition of community because now you belong to the nature and the environment around you. Okay, so the o what do you inhale every day is the oxygen. Who provides it? It's the nature. And the ground that you are working on every day, who provides it? It's the mother earth, right? And the water that you drink the food that you're eating, whatever comes in your body, it all comes from the nature. And you guys are all share the sunlight, the, oxy the oxygen to survive, to grow, to nourish. So because that point, you and the nature are in one same community. So what I'm trying to say here is like, we all belong and we all interconnected. We, uh, we were born in a community, but we are also the person who recreate a community. Actually, I think we and a community are not really separate. We are as a whole. When you talk community, you are talking about yourself. So since we're talking about ourselves, not, uh, not the community outside, community inside of us, uh, in the area of us, we should have responsibilities. I think every person they should have responsibility for themselves. But why? Why is that? Now let's get back to the Maslow hierarchy. If you see that, 
the feeling of love and belonging, but at the end of the day, everybody they wants to be recognized. They want people to acknowledge of their own values, and they want to figure out why am I here? What's the purpose of my life? What's the purpose of my existence, right? It's a self-actualization. But to get to that point, you have to have love and belonging. If there's no one standing in front of you, hey, you're so good, hey, your work is amazing, how can you know that? If there is no one around you, how can you evaluate, how can you realize your own values? Just imagine that. Of course, it's not going to happen. But if it happened, there's no one there to see, to compliment, to praise you, how come you realize your own values? And then your life has no meaning because of that, because you don't have any community. So since we understand that, how to give back, how to create values to give back, and where to start to create values? For me, I start small. What do I mean by start small? Let me tell you about my old story. When I was a little kid, I got everything that I want. My parents, they might not be the richest one, but they afforded me with everything. I learned to play the piano when I was five years old. And I had like, for the first 15 years of my life, my mom, she celebrated the birthday party and she invited everyone in my neighborhood. You know, my birthday party always welcomed like a hundred people. And some of them, I don't even know their faces. <laughs> yeah, my mom, she's like, she's so like, I don't know. But then, and during my high school year, I always ran like the top three students in my high school. Because of that mindset, I always think like I, I have been destined to be some to be on top, to be a great, to be the best person. But things have actually changed when I turned 18. When I turned 18, I felt my very first college exam in Vietnam. Whenever you want to apply for a university or college, you have to take the entrance the same. And it's so hectic. S sometimes you have to spend like two years on that to prepare for it. And everybody expected me to get a very high score and to just like went to the university that I prefer. But no, I failed completely. And also at that time, my father, he went bankrupt. You know, he lost like around 400,000 US dollars in two years because he invested in the stock trading market. We had to sell our houses and all the real estate and we had to move out and rent a house to live in. And that was like the darkest time of my life, you know? Like you, you, have, living, you have been living in a pink world for so long and now everything just turned upside down. Your study, no, your family, I don't want to mention about it. It was so bad. But then I, I couldn't enter to the university that I like, so I had to go to another, for another option. I applied for another private college in graphic design. <laughs> yeah, in graphic design. But then I felt stuck there. I couldn't find any happiness. You know, I could not find, like even my friends, my classmates, they were so passionate in what they're doing. They could spend hours sketching, illustrating, drawing, done a lot of things, and they were so keen on it. But for me, I felt so lost. I always feel like I was left behind in my class. I always felt whenever assignment or task given to me, and I didn't know what to do with my life at that time. I was completely out of that community, even when I tried my best. Then I thought of dropping out of the college, but, it but it's actually a very hard decision. Why is that? Because during my grow up, in my family, there's a gap. Some of my friends might know that already. Like, about, like my father, he's a very smart guy. Even his family is not rich, but he's got a bachelor degree, which is something very precious in Vietnam during his ages. And he's also one of the first person in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam that be able to use the computer. <laughs> yeah, he's super smart. Meanwhile, my mom, she has no education and she has no father. Her mother was a vagabond, my grandmom. She has no employment and she has no home. 
she would just she just wander around Vietnam, and like she even worked, uh, you know, for nightclubs and sometimes as a prostitute, as I heard from my mom. So because of that, my family, my father's family thought that my mom will become another version of my grandma, because she has no education, and because of that. If there is something wrong in my family, it's all because of my mom. They would think that my mom indulged me too much. My mom spoiled me. But that's so unfair, right? I mean, like, in this modern society, I know it's good to have education. It's good to have money. But sometimes we, p we depend on it too much. We use it as a criteria to evaluate a human values. That's another, s that's another story. But that's how I observed during my grow up. So because of that, I was, it was so hard for me to make a decision to drop out of my college. Because if I did that, my big family, they would keep complaining in sour offended my family, especially my mom. They did that a lot of times. And it's very common in Vietnam. I don't know how it is here, but it's very common in Vietnam. But at the end of the day, I finally dropped. I just couldn't stand it. You know, like every day, like my mom, she cried like in those two years, my mom, she cried every night and my father, he kept telling me about his suicidal thoughts. He just wanted to, you know, get out of this world. He's so sick of it. He wanted to die every day. And me and my brother were so young, so we didn't know what to do. But it's all a mental breakdown, you know, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so during my gap time, I spent like two months at home doing nothing. I just eating, sleeping, playing Pokemon. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. It was so depressing for me. Because like before that, I think like I, I was so good and now I'm here. I'm nowhere near to the average student, to the average young adult like me. Then one day I found a an advertising banner online. They recruited some volunteer for a project about autism children. This project was coordinated by a group of Vietnamese students in collaboration with students from the UCLA, University of California and, and Los Angeles. Yeah. So I just applied for that. And I think it was a luck for me and it was a major shift of my life. Like, I don't know, I passed all three rounds the online applications and you know the interview and the final test, I, I passed it. And it was like, it's been a long time that I feel so happy doing something that I work for. We co-work on a social campaign to raise awareness about autism children. In Vietnam, parents who have autism children, they were so scared to mention about it because the people will trust their children. So they hide the children in a closet. They don't want to reveal it to the public. But because of that, the longer you keep your children, your autism children in a closet, the more severe their life will turn out to be. They will receive less opportunities to, you know, to get proper treatment and they could not grow normally as the other children. But when I work with the autism children, actually they are not you know, as weird, as freaky as people usually think they're actually cool. Some of them have talents. They're super good, they're so excellent in drawing, painting, they dance to the music, and they talk. They have their own talk, they have their own personality, their own characteristic. And it's not something that I have ever thought before. That's my very first experience and my very first lesson. One year later, I was introduced to work for Breast Cancer Network Vietnam. And I have been working for this organization for almost two years up to now as a part-time and online yeah, since I started here. Last year I came back, last summer I came back to Vietnam to coordinate a series of workshops in yoga, meditation, drawing, in English classes and makeup for the patients. Because in Vietnam we focus too much about raising awareness but sometimes we forget to organize the activities to directly improve the physical and mental well-being of the patients. So I came up with the idea and I found sponsors and people who can support me with that activity. And at the end of my series of workshops, one of the patients, he came to me. Nam, this is amazing. 
I felt so thankful for that, for, uh, for having all of this happening. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, it's my pleasure, you know. I just feel happy and this is what, this is, I feel like all I need to do to bring to you guys something. And then she told me a story. Still this summertime of last year, last summer, she was diagnosed with the fourth stage of breast cancer. She lost all her hair and she has to get rid of her breast. Then she, you know, she lost like around 15, 15 kilograms. She becomes smaller and smaller, she's so tiny. And the other patient who went to the same hospital with her, they even said that they had to celebrate birthday party for her like five times in one month because they don't think that she can survive in that long time. She could not bear it any longer. So they, so they want her to have some fun. But it's just the physical pain. The mental pain is even worse, you know? She had two children and she told me one day I was lying on the bed and my husband brought another chick home, brought another girl home. They all came to her lying on the bed with no hair. And he said that, why don't you just go die? You fuck out of this life. Why don't you just go to hell? Why are you still alive with his new girlfriend? And this thing is very, very, very common in the world of breast cancer patients. You know, as a woman, when you lost your breast, the men, some men, like most of the men in Vietnam, they will think like they're not interested in you anymore because the, the cancer prevented you from having, you know, from conducting sexual activities. They don't care about the emotional connection, they care more about the physical appearance. And that is a big loss of the women in my community. But miracles happen, actually mir miracles happen. She got funded by a group of Vietnamese people and she got a full treatment in four months. She recovered so quickly. And even the doctor said that it was a miracle. They could not believe that, you know? She recovered so quickly. Now she could even ride the motorbike. And she told me now I could even climb the coconut tree. <laughs> Yeah, she did that, and it was so amazing. Now, the lady who's standing in front of me, she looks nothing like a breast cancer patient. She's so energetic, she has a lot of good vibes to share with me, and it was so amazing. And just a small talk with her keeps me th thinking a lot about my life purposes today. Like, right after when I got home, I keep asking myself, have I tried hard enough? Have I really done all my best to, you know, achieve all my goals. Because she told me she has been through all the darkest times of her life. Now she has nothing to lose. She basically has nothing. So she's just done everything, whatever she wants to do. And when I look back my darkest time, I feel like it's not, it's not anything, you know. It's nothing to compare with her darkest time. And this is yeah, this is my community. This is all the breast cancer patients. They join the drawing workshop, and this is all the drawing they made that. And this one is from Pratanandi. When I come to Bangkok, I volunteer for two organizations, one called Pratanandi, and the other is Mercy Centers. My work is to teach English for children and underprivileged women. Uh, the women, some of them are the same age with my mom, and some of them are even older. But I don't feel like they are strangers. I feel a deep connection with those people. I feel like I'm sharing my knowledge with my sister, my aunts, you know. And I feel a deep connection. But in exchange, they also give me something. Like these ladies, they teach me about it's never too late to start something again. They are 40 years old, they are 45 years old, they are almost 50 years old, and now they start to study English. It's not too late because they want to improve their life. They want to not depend on any other man. They want to sustain their own financial issues. And the children, oh, I could. <laughs> the children, these are all my, my kids. Yeah, they are like my children. I'm so, you know, I'm so into little children. And they teach me about, you know, how to appreciate their present and how to be open-minded. They remind me of myself when I was little, 
how I started to learn, how I started to adapt myself to the new world. Because as, as adults, when we grew up, we developed with so many patterns that sometimes it prevents us from growing better. So my point here is that even when the thing that I'm doing, I'm trying to create values to my community, but at the same time, they are giving me back the values from them. So it's an infinite loop. It's human and community, it's an infinite loop. So in my last work, I just want to say, it's good to know that you always belong to somewhere and no worries that you're out of this community. And if one day you feel like you don't know what to do, how to be successful, don't think too much. Even when your dream is big, start by doing small things and make sure that everything that you do creates some, even like, you know, trivial, some tiny values. It matters, it actually matters. And then you can grow beyond out of yourself. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, let, let me start a question. I'm interested in the meditation that you have practiced. Um, related to that, um, do you believe in ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It used to happen at my in my home in Vietnam. So you have s have you seen one? Not really. Like, have you ever heard about like there's a ghost and then they come into your body and then you act like somebody else? It happened in my in my house when I was little. Yeah. So I think I like you know partly believe that. <laughs> and do you believe that there there is like both good and bad ghost. Yeah, I think so. So, uh, like I mean like ghosts are just like human, right? Even human we are good and bad person and why ghosts they can be good and bad. Uh -huh. And does it affect to your life? Your affect to my life? Uh, to your living or to your decision or anything? Yeah, I think it comes from my mom like she's uh, she Buddhist. So uh -huh. like she believe a lot in you know the metaphysical things. So see, like every for this year, like um, in the lunar calendar, it's the ghost month. So uh, yeah, it's the ghost month. So basically, at during this month, all the ghosts from the hell they will go back to visit their relative and their family. So uh, my mom, like she, she goes, she go for vegan the whole month. Oh. Yeah, even my dad, okay. just this month. But it's, it, it doesn't really affect me. Like for me, I'm more like, you know, I'm home and I'm open to any religions. Okay, so, so I believe more in the good things, in the good things. I'm not like uh, we have to worship some, you know, specific so gods, something like that. Um, so God is a part of the community we are in, right? Okay. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry I'm talking okay, about yes, this, but yeah, I, I, believe I try that. to like link the idea of like belief and yes, belief. what you are in the real life. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for a very great speech, no? Um, my question is, what make a good, good community become great? Sorry, can, can What make that? good community become great? Good community become great. I think the major issues, like the, the that nowadays, whatever we do, it's not only about community, it's uh, even when when we do business, we should care more about ethics and the values that we are creating. Like you know, it's it's for the long term. Like if you only care about money, you might be you might be successful in three or four years, but in the long run, people they don't see any values that you are creating that you are giving back to the community. It matters. So from being good to being great, that's like when you start to create more and more and more values and you are becoming more ethical, then obviously you're going to be from good to great. And to be great, I think it depends on the perspective of each, each person. And for me, being great means you are creating values and you are doing everything with your own ethics. Yeah. I think that's, that's enough, that's, 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 that's very enough for this modern world. We talk a lot about being ethical, being doing good things, but actually, we did not really do that. Even my father, I have to say, I, I, I don't want to say bad things about my father, but he cares a lot about money. Um, he's now he, nowadays he's like he practicing some feng shui, something like you know astrology stuff. But when we he reads somebody birth chart, he always tell me like, 
none, this person is good and this person is bad. And I was like, okay, so how good and how bad? He said, he's good because in his stage of life, he has to have a big fortune. He has to go and to have a lot of money. So his life is good. And this guy, he has no money, so his life is bad. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> How come you evaluate somebody based on, based on the fact that he's rich or not? He might not have a lot of money, but he's still happy, like people in the countryside, because their demand are less, so they don't really, you know, they don't need that much money to be happy. So still, I think it depends on your own ideology, your own perspective. I would say that. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, how did you first come here to Bangkok from Vietnam? What was your first step over here? I, uh, actually, I, I used to work for a training center in Vietnam as a craft designer during my gap time. And then like, there are some partners with some university in Bangkok. Actually, the first university that I knew about is Webster University, but they did not offer a full scholarship. So I just forget that. And the tuition fee were, were so high, and they are like our Bangkok. So I don't want to go there. Then, you know, I think the name Bangkok University is a trick, <laughs> you know? Wh when you type like Bangkok Universities, then Bangkok University show up, <laughs> right? It's actually a very good strategy. I don't know like, if, if it has been done on purpose or not. But when students they search for Bangkok University, BU show up. <laughs> yeah, that's how I found out about BU. And what do you think about the differences that you've seen in community between Vietnam and being here in Bangkok? Like oh. because you're from Ho Chi Minh City. Ho Chi Minh City. So yes. like the differences between the city communities between Ho Chi Minh City and Bangkok. I would say they they are quite similar. They they're not really different. But then still what I found in Vietnam is that like uh, you know, the things that they do, they might have a good intention, but still they think more about themselves. Like most most of the young people that I know they want to volunteer beca because they think it's good for the CV or for the resume. Yeah, it's not really comes from what they <laughs> Where they lose all the ethic and all the morality. That's what I observe from a new generation in Vietnam. And the difference, yeah, it's, not, it's quite similar, but I would say that here in Bangkok, they have more or organizations that really work on women. Like in Vietnam, we don't really have a, any popular organizations that about you know, women empowerment. I'm going to create one next year, but now, uh, yeah, we are working on that, and we are actually receiving funding from Australia. Mm. Hey, thank you. I think you can see why he was chosen to be uh, the first student we have for this speaker series. And um, before we conclude, I have a, a special gift I'd like to give him as thanks for doing that, as well as to invite all of you to come back and have a few more donuts to chit chat with each other. For the students here, we actually have two new faculty members that you may not know, Ajahn Shambay from Business English and Ajahn Charlotte, who is the program uh, chairperson, uh, get my language right now, chairperson of Business English. They look like they've been here a couple years, but they've been here a few weeks. <laughs> uh, trust me, I'm very much aware. And we have our new friend who's a guest from the outside, and he had no community, so I want everyone to make him part of our community as an honorary BUI member. Just so you know, my name is Michael Fall. I'm the dean of BUI. And so thank you very much for coming to our event. Now, before we go, let you go and uh, let people talk to you more one-on-one, -on -one, Ajahn Sai has a little gift. <laughs> 